We start, of course, uh, this morning on a solemn note, and uh, it is interesting that we are thinking about church and state on a day like this, um, as we think of those who, stir, who serve us and uh, who sometimes, therefore, even have to lay down their lives uh, in their service of the state and of citizens. Uh, so I do express my deepest sympathy uh, to you, especially those who are from Dallas, uh, about what has happened, and pray that uh, in the end some good will come out of this as the nation examines its conscience about these matters. I thought that in the first session this morning, uh, I would uh, talk you through the story of how church and state have related uh, in Anglicanism, and that, of course, uh, for a very great part means the Church of England in different ways, though not only that. Uh, and then in the session this afternoon, when you're nice and sleepy, uh, then we will come to the important issues that are raised by the story. Uh, that'll wake you up, hope hopefully. So uh, the, uh, the relationship of church to state really begins with uh, the story of the evangelization of England, the arrival of Augustine and the conversion of Ethelbert. I mean, that is um, absolutely key because uh, if Ethelbert, who was at that time the most powerful king of the Anglo-Saxons, if he had not been converted, the story would have been very different. And the way for Augustine had been prepared, of course, by Ethelbert's wife, Bertha, who was already a Christian and who had brought a bishop as her chaplain to the royal household. It's amazing how God prepares peoples and nations uh, for the gospel, the preparatio evangelica, as it is called. And certainly in this case, uh, it was very effective. The relationship of Ethelbert uh, to Augustine and the missionaries who came with him was a good one, uh, and Ethelbert was responsible for the spreading of the faith uh, in many different parts, not only of his kingdom, but beyond his kingdom uh, during his lifetime. And so it is right that we uh, refer to him um, as a saint, just as we do with Augustine of Canterbury. Not only uh, did Ethelbert himself relate the Christian faith to the state, but the church also, especially in those who followed Augustine, uh, contributed to this strengthening relationship. So uh, the arrival uh, of Theodore of Tarsus uh, as Archbishop of Canterbury is uh, of great importance in this matter. Um, Theodore arrived with Hadrian the African. So you have another man from Tarsus. Um, you know how that first man from Tarsus changed the story uh, of the whole world. Uh, here's another man from Tarsus in Asia Minor. Uh, who came to be an Archbishop of Canterbury. Hadrian the African actually was someone the Pope had wanted uh, to be Archbishop, and he said, no, no, this is not for me, uh, but I'll go with the new Archbishop. Now, uh, these two men, uh, between themselves, uh, established so much of what we take for granted. So Theodore established the parochial system in England, and uh, that was not just about the church, because the parish system became the basic unit of civil society. It still is. I mean, the parish is still the basic unit of government in England. Um, not just the ecclesiastical parish, but the civil parish. So uh, the system of government was established by the church. Similarly, Hadrian the African was interested in uh, education and the system of schools that he established 
uh, throughout the land was really the first attempt at any kind of organized education. Uh, I say this uh, sometimes to people when they object to state-funded church schools in England, uh, which many people these days do, and I say to them, well, the church was here first. The state is actually, uh, in England anyway, uh, a relative latecomer to the business of universal education. It was only in the 1860s that the state began to have schools. Um, so I say, well, fine, you're welcome, uh, but we were here first. Don't forget that. Uh, by a long way, and of course this is true of the, of the church's work in many different parts of the world. Now, uh, the, uh, the progress was not always uh, linear and smooth. Uh, there were all sorts of disruptions and disturbances. So there were kings who tried to go back to paganism, just as with the Roman Empire, so also in Anglo-Saxon England. In fact, Ethelbert's uh, successor, Eadbald, tried to do that. Uh, and Lawrence, who was Archbishop of Canterbury at that time, had to resist him. Uh, and finally, Eadbald, I think, was reconverted, or converted for the first time, who knows. Um, and similar things happened in York, where Paulinus, who was a missionary from Rochester, uh, went to evangelize York under uh, Edwin, but after Edwin's defeat, York lapsed back into paganism, and Paulinus had to run back to Rochester, which was great for Rochester, uh, but not so good for York. So there were uh, these disturbances that continued to happen, internal disturbances, and then there were, of course, external invasions, the continual threat of the Vikings. Uh, the invasions of the, of the Vikings, the pillaging, the destruction, uh, the rape. I mean, this was something that was ordinary experience uh, in that world. And, uh, in that context, the, uh, the work of Alfred the Great needs to be remembered. Again, we have a king, a Christian king, who very courageously resisted the Vikings and defeated them really by sheer willpower, it seems. I mean, the Vikings were far superior in uh, war technology, in numbers, in ferociousness, certainly, uh, but uh, uh, Alfred was able to motivate his people uh, finally to defeat the Vikings. But when he had defeated them, he did not become vengeful. You know, the Vikings fully expected him to eliminate them. But he didn't do that. He actually incorporated them into his kingdom. And this was a growing kingdom, and Alfred is often regarded as the king who made it possible for England to become a unified kingdom. Um, and he did this by incorporating the different people, the Celts, the Vikings, the Anglo-Saxons of different kinds, um, into his kingdom. And in doing so, well, he did many different things, including the strengthening of the church, but he uh, tried to establish a common law. You know, that is the origin of the, of the phrase, by the way. So he took uh, what was best in the customs of the Celts, the Anglo-Saxons, the Vikings, and so on, to bring it together into some kind of unified system of law. But he also made sure that uh, this common law was consistent with the Bible, with the Decalogue. And so this desire in courts that uh, pay, uh, well, at least lip service uh, to common law, to have the Decalogue in the courts, goes right back to Alfred the Great. So, you know, when people are removing tables of the Ten Commandments from the courts, they're disturbing a very ancient connection indeed not just something arbitrary that people thought up in the 19th century or whatever. Um, I received a letter from a very senior judge, the second most senior judge in England. I don't know why she wrote to me. There must have been a good reason. 
but she said, of course, Bishop, she said. Uh, you probably know now who it is. Um, our laws are based on the Ten Commandments and on our Lord's summary of them. These are her words. Uh, and I said to myself, hallelujah, uh, but I wish that your judgments were also so based on the Ten Commandments and on our Lord's summary of them. That's a different story. But all of this goes back to King Alfred, uh, his work of translation, his work of lawmaking, his work of unifying the kingdom. Now, in the Anglo-Saxon period, you also have the emergence of what was known as the Witten. Do people, have you heard of that word before, the Witten? What, do you know what that was? No, sorry, this is, this is the one that doesn't work. <laughs> what was the Witten, anyone? Yes, indeed. Um, now, of course, this has its origins in the gathering of tribal elders and so on in the Anglo-Saxon world. But as the Witten developed, uh, it developed uh, particularly with the bishops and the abbots playing a huge role in uh, advising the king and therefore being important parts of the Witten. So again, these days there are often debates about whether uh, a certain number of bishops should be members of the House of Lords, as um, I was. And um, again, I say to them, as with education, uh, you know, the bishop started this business. If you want to join in, fine. But uh, why question something uh, that is fundamental to the very existence uh, of the parliamentary system, certainly in England? With the coming of the Normans, um, we find um, that uh, the church had from time to time to resist the monarchs. So um, St. Anselm of Canterbury, well-known uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, he would not crown Henry I until Henry had agreed something called a Charter of Liberties. Uh, this is the first instance of the king being made by the church to grant the subjects of the kingdom certain liberties uh, and uh, to, uh, to take an oath to honor those liberties before the coronation and the, uh, the enthronement. The Charter of Liberties uh, is the immediate uh, predecessor, if you like, to Magna Carta. That is where the idea first emerged. Uh, but we also have, of course, the, the famous resistance of Thomas a Becket to Henry II. Uh, again, it was the independence of the church that was the issue at the time. With Magna Carta, uh, we have, I mean, I'm sorry that uh, this is not mentioned in many secular stories of Magna Carta, but you see, in those days, the people who could write were the clergy, hence the word clerk. And uh, it was Stephen Langton, Archbishop of Canterbury, who was uniquely equipped uh, to bring about Magna Carta, he had been, uh, before he became a bishop, a scholar who particularly considered the relationship of kings and their subjects in the medieval world. So he knew what he was doing, in other words. And um, not only was he responsible for the drafting of Magna Carta, uh, but he also defended, it, uh, defended its uh, survival against King John, who did everything, including going to the Pope to get it annulled. But uh, Stephen Langton held Rochester Castle. I mean, I used to live just underneath it uh, for a whole year against John. And if he had not done so, we would not have had Magna Carta today and the huge influence that <coughs> Magna Carta has had on the liberties of people not only in Britain, but also in this country, of course. Um, 
At this time also, as you know, there was a struggle going on between the papacy and the emerging monarchies of Europe, and England uh, was not exempt from this struggle. Uh, there was the question about who should invest bishops, for instance, uh, which went on for a long time, uh, about taxes paid uh, to the papacy, about appeals to Rome against decisions by the English courts and indeed other courts as well. And uh, in this matter, the, what happened before, this is well before the Reformation, well before the Reformation, they developed a system that a bishop could not be elected by the chapter of the cathedral unless the king had issued permission to do so, which was known as the conge delere. Um, people heard this phrase before? Permission to elect. Um, and so it was an offense for the chapter to elect anyone without the king's permission, uh, well before the Reformation, centuries before. And if they did so, they were liable to the penalties of premanure. Um, now, um, of course, this tussle, as we all know, came to a head with Henry VIII. And uh, by the act uh, of supremacy, Henry claimed for himself all the rights, not just of kingdom and indeed of empire, because he described England as an empire, uh, but also all the rights that the papacy had hitherto exercised, academically, uh, judicially, uh, fiscally in all sorts of ways. And um, one of the things that was done at the time was uh, a modification in the conge delere, which was now not just about the permission to elect, but along with it a letter from the king specifying whom they should elect. It's an example of controlled democracy, if you like. Um, so that means that uh, the only nominee who was being elected was a nominee of the, of the monarch. Um, this custom still persists, by the way, uh, in the election of bishops in the Church of England. The penalties, which were very severe of premanure, were actually um, repealed only in this, in the last century, within the last hundred years or so. Um, but the act of supremacy, of course, made Henry uh, the head, uh, the supreme head in earth of the Church of England. I mean, that was what he claimed. You remember I was talking about convocations and their lack of courage at the time, though lack of courage in the face of a Henry VIII is pretty excusable. I mean, he was a very ferocious uh, king. Uh, he demanded that convocations uh, should accept him as uh, a supreme head of the church in England uh, and a supreme head of the church as he was supreme head of everything else. You see, that was the claim was that he had authority uh, over uh, everything in his realm. Um, there were people who resisted, of course. John Fisher of Rochester lost his head. The Pope made a mistake in making him a cardinal. And Henry is reputed to have said, let the Pope give him a red hat. I will make sure he has no head to wear it. And Sir Thomas More, of course, uh, as, you, as you all know, uh, and his martyrdom for refusing to accept the royal supremacy. The convocations, as I was saying, did accept 
the royal supremacy, but with a proviso, insofar as the law of Christ allows. Uh, that proviso Henry, of course, neglected. Um, in many different ways, um, apart from the claim to royal supremacy, Henry remained a Catholic. I mean, Henry was not a Protestant in, by any stretch of the imagination. In his view of the sacraments, his view of priesthood, uh, his view of episcopal office, in all of those things, in worship of the church, he very much remained on the Catholic side. And it, uh, we had to wait until Edward, uh, Edward's accession uh, for uh, the Protestant party uh, to become more influential. And of course, the difference is seen uh, in the 1549 prayer book, which although issued uh, by the time Edward had become uh, king, uh, reflected very much the kind of thing that Henry had wanted for the Church of England, uh, and the 1552 book, which is much more influenced uh, by Protestant thinking. Um, the, the coming of Mary to the throne and the return to the Roman Catholic Church uh, and the bloody uh, martyrdoms that ensued probably ensured that when Mary died, England would become once again uh, a country that was out of communion with Rome. It was a very um, great piece of miscalculation on the part of Mary and of her advisors. Uh, Philip of Spain actually I don't think can be blamed for this. I don't think he was responsible for the bloodiness of Mary's reign, which is why she's called Bloody Mary, of course. Um, but it did ensure that when Elizabeth came to the throne, uh, that there had to be some kind of, well, it's called a settlement, isn't it? But maybe it's a compromise that there was a compromise between Catholic and Protestant elements in the church which persisted. So, so much of our heritage is actually making room for a Catholic interpretation of the sacraments, of ministry, uh, for instance, uh, and of Protestant elements, uh, for instance, to do with justification by faith, um, or the supremacy of the scriptures, uh, in the formularies of the Anglican tradition. Now, of course, uh, some people were not satisfied with this, with, with the settlement or, or the compromise. So the Puritans held, even then, and for a hundred years after that, that the Reformation had not been completed in the Church of England. Uh, it had been left incomplete that uh, what to them were Romish elements in the liturgy, in the understanding of baptism, of Holy Communion, etc., uh, that all of this had to be tackled. Um, and if you are looking for the possibility of dissent in Anglicanism, then the Puritans are certainly one example of continuing dissent. Uh, for a very long time. And uh, in case you think the Puritans have gone away, they haven't. I mean, there is a, a very strong Puritan-influenced uh, section of evangelicalism in the Church of England today. Uh, of course, in, in the present circumstances uh, of the challenges to Christian, uh, Christian morals, for example, uh, they and other Orthodox Christians have a great deal in common. But this sense that the Reformation has not been completed in Anglicanism still persists in, in that part of the church, if you like. Uh, very much so. I have left my water down there. May I have it back, please? Thank you very much. Um,
Well, um, we then have the very sad event surrounding Charles I and Archbishop Laud. Uh, the perception that Laud and Charles were trying to enforce episcopacy on the Scots, for instance, um, and indeed a Catholic understanding of the sacraments on, on the whole church, uh, led to the rebellion, um, to the civil war, uh, to regicide, to the um, execution of Charles I, uh, and indeed of Archbishop Lord himself, uh, to the establishing of a commonwealth which was Puritan dominated, of course. Uh, and it appeared that uh, at that time, it must have appeared to people that the Reformation had now been completed according to the Puritan view of things. Uh, but the, then the reaction at the Restoration, um, the Bishop of Rochester, for instance, was deprived of his living, of course, during the Commonwealth, uh, of his see, and um, when he was restored as uh, an act of thanksgiving, he built a house uh, for uh, uh, people who had uh, themselves lost their fortune in one way or another. It is now a care home, very nice care home, and uh, Valerie, my wife's mother, lived there until she died a few weeks ago. So um, that sort of act of a Bishop of Rochester um, as he was restored, as indeed the monarchy was restored. You see, um, no king, no bishop, kind of um, the, the cry that went up under Charles was found to be true with the restoration. When there is a king, there is also a bishop. And this close connection has caused uh, both problems for the church and provided it with privileges. I mean, that that cannot be denied. But the tragedy at the Restoration was that of the Great Ejection, when a very large number of Puritan-minded uh, clergy in the Church of England were ejected because uh, they were not deemed to be Anglican enough. Some of them very distinguished theologians like Richard Baxter. Uh, again, the, uh, the memory of this uh, remains in people's consciousness of, of the great ejection. Um, but many of the people who took part in the great ejection themselves faced a crisis very quickly because um, James II, uh, when he became king, was known to be a Roman Catholic. I think it is the only time when the coronation service has not included the Eucharist, the coronation of James II, because of course he could not take communion as a Roman Catholic in the Church of England. Uh, and um, those um, bishops and clergy who opposed him uh, found themselves facing a dilemma when James II was made to flee. Now I think Bishop Sutton is the is the expert here. I don't know, is he here? Where is he? Oh, there you're right at the yeah, hit and run place, that is, you know. <laughs> um, um, when James was forced to flee the country and William and Mary were welcomed, uh, who came from Holland as the new king and queen, um, Many of the clergy and the bishops in the Church of England who had been critical of James II's Roman Catholicism actually, now refused to take the oath of obedience to William and Mary because they said they had taken an oath to James. And you, you, you can't take um, two such oaths of allegiance. Uh, and so without due process, um, Parliament deprived the bishops of their sees and the clergy of their livings. So what has happened here in the Episcopal Church does have a precedent, of 
course. Um, including, in this case, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and they are the people who formed uh, what Bishop Ray was talking about, the non-jurors, the people who could not take an oath to William and Mary because they had already taken one to the exile James. Now, the non-jurors were a disparate group. I mean, they were not, um, they were not homogeneous, if you like, uh, not monochrome. Some continued to worship in their parish churches, although they could not, of course, hold office. Some formed Christian communities of their own. Uh, some refused uh, to consecrate mo uh, new bishops, uh, but some did, having obtained the conge delire from the exile James. They did make uh, non-jura bishops as well. Um, and they continued to exist for well over a hundred years. Uh, they were conscious very much of the Catholicity of the church, uh, and this is why they opened up negotiations uh, both with Rome and with Eastern Orthodoxy on the possibility of union uh, so that they could be part of the wider Catholic church. Uh, from the Orthodox patriarchs, they received very haughty letters that um, demanded all sorts of things. And they very respectfully said that uh, there were certain things that they were, even as high churchmen, unwilling to accept. So although they believed in the real presence at the Eucharist, uh, they drew back from Eucharistic adoration. Um, uh, although they had a high regard for the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, uh, the God-bearer, uh, they drew back from uh, invocation of the Blessed Virgin and of the saints. Uh, they appreciated uh, the use of icons, but they would not venerate them, and so on. So the whole thing didn't come to very much, but this is a lesson for us in ecumenism today, uh, uh, because very often the issues are very similar. Uh, although the non-jurors died out eventually, as Bishop Ray was saying, they have had a permanent influence on Anglicanism. And this is partly because they influenced the revision of the liturgy of the Scottish Episcopal Church. Uh, the prayer book of the Scottish Episcopal Church uh, owes uh, a great deal to the liturgies created by the non-jurors. And of course, the liturgy of the Scottish Episcopal Church uh, is influential on the uh, liturgy of the Episcopal Church in this country. This is another prayer book tradition. It is not the 1552, 1662 English prayer book tradition. This is another prayer book tradition. Uh, and you know, when Anglicans speak of the prayer book, I often find <laughs> Uh, that they mean different prayer books, actually. Uh, and sometimes different prayer books at, in different ages. Um, and they may think they're talking about the same thing, but actually they're not, uh, because there are significant differences, of course. And the Scottish liturgy, in turn, has been hugely influential in many different parts of the world, not just here. The non-jurors, um, again, were influential uh, in the emergence of Tractarianism in the Church of England. Now, you know the immediate cause of the, of the Oxford movement. It was the, pre the preaching of the, um, of the sermon by Keble. Uh, and the immediate occasion was the desire of the state to suppress a certain number of Irish bishoprics. Uh, I'm preaching um, at an ordination in an Irish diocese soon, so I better watch what I say. But um, it has always seemed to me that Ireland has a very large number of bishops relative to population. Um, but I may just be prejudiced, of course. Um, 
So the question was not whether these bishoprics should be suppressed, but who should suppress them? Should it be the state or the church? And so um, um, the Tractarian movement began with an affirmation of the spiritual independence of the church over and against the state. Um, they began to see more and more, if you read through the tracts of the Times, of course many of them edited by Newman, some of them written by Newman, um, that uh, the Reformation settlement, the Elizabethan settlement, was seen as hopelessly Erastian. Um, and uh, the Tractarians began to, to claim that the uh, inheritance of the church had been sold um, to the state and it had to be reclaimed uh, that the church was understood as a distinctive spiritual community over and against the state. Uh, and so a lot of Anglo-Catholic uh, writing subsequent to the Oxford movement has been about that. Um, sometimes very radically uh, so. Uh, I mean, I was um, to some extent amused by uh, Archbishop Rowan Williams when he became Archbishop of Canterbury doing all these Erastian things that an Archbishop of Canterbury has to do because uh, he was before this, along with David Nichols, a radical critic of establishment Anglicanism. I mean, I've got all his writings from, from that time. Um, yes, yeah, so office does make us do strange things. Uh, I think the, the Anglo-Catholic tradition has been influential in Anglicanism as a whole in resisting the power of the state when that needs to be resisted. So. The church's role, the Anglican church's role in South Africa in the struggle against apartheid uh, came about partly because of the Anglo-Catholic uh, background of that church. Um, and of course the evangelical part of that church, the Church of England in South Africa, did not take part in that resistance to apartheid. Um, certainly in England, uh, the Tractarians were very involved in um, going to the poor parts of cities, uh, working there, especially the new orders or the revived orders of, uh, of uh, monks and nuns uh, devoted themselves to working with the poor, to fighting for justice and you know all of those things. That was a real part of the Anglo-Catholic revival. Uh, I'm sorry that in the Church of England with the debate on the ordination of women and other things, that that side of Anglo-Catholicism is not as prominent as it used to be. Let's, let's put it like that. Um, so when we come to the 20th century, we have, of course, the two great wars. And um, in the first war, the church certainly uh, was involved uh, with the state. Uh, in the justification of that war, uh, the first war being very difficult to justify really, uh, quite differently from the Second World War. Uh, but also uh, there were demands, for instance, um, about prayer for the dead. So many people had been killed. And the Church of England uh, began to provide for this at about this time. Um, well, we can debate whether, you know, how right that was or, or not, but that is when it began to happen because of the, of the need of the hour in the nation, not, not just in the church. Uh, and then there was, of course, the, uh, the well-known conflict about the revision of the prayer book. Um, so in 1928, Parliament rejected the revised prayer book 
Uh, and this caused a crisis for many people. Um, I've just delivered the Hensley Henson lecture in the University of Durham. Hensley Henson was a distinguished bishop of Durham uh, who was very establishmentarian in all his writing up to the point of the rejection by parliament of the revised prayer book. And then he changed completely. He became a great advocate for disestablishment uh, because he, he saw that Parliament could uh, immediately uh, interfere in the affairs of the Church, uh, that it could reject something that had to do with the worship and doctrine of the Church in, in that sort of way. Um, and then in, in, uh, uh, in the Second War, uh, two things need to be noted. One is the work of William Temple, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, who laid the foundation for the welfare state. I mean, that, of course, uh, is a very positive development. Uh, but the negative side of it was that the church gave away many of the things that it was doing with the poor in medicine, in education, to the state because of this belief in uh, the state being the appropriate organ for the delivery of welfare. I mean, this uh, causes huge problems even today in Britain uh, with the National Health Service, for instance, that has now grown uh, to such an extent that it is not able efficiently to deliver uh, the kind of health care that it was thought it should deliver. Uh, and whether this uh, model, centralized model of welfare is the right model for the future is, of course, a question that is being asked and is worth asking. I'm quite sure that there will have to be some attempt at reform of the system. But uh, behind it is the figure of William Temple. The second thing is that uh, as opposed to the first war in the, in the, in the, during the second war and in its aftermath, the church was critical of some of the things that were done. So again, I refer to Bishop Bell, who is in odium these days, I'm sorry to say, uh, but his criticism of the carpet bombing of Dresden um, cost him the Archbishopric of Canterbury uh, but it was a great act of courage uh, to, to say this at that time, at that time. Since then, uh, although the church, of course, has taken a stand on a number of issues and uh, has uh, rightly uh, done so, there has also been um, a story in the last, 60, 70 years of one capitulation after another. So uh, the church supported, um, of course, um, the liberalization of laws against homosexuality. Uh, but what the church thought uh, would happen, it didn't stop there. So the liberalization has carried on, as, as we all know. Uh, the church supported the liberalization of abortion laws. Again, because it thought that uh, what it was doing was uh, making it easier for the very hard cases that were adduced in support of the change in law. But again, as we all know, uh, the abortion law in, in Britain, as, as here, has led now to a situation almost of abortion on demand. Uh, the church supported the liberalization of divorce law, again, because hard cases were quoted. Uh, but now we have um, no fault divorce without consent. I mean, what kind of view of marriage does the state have if you have that kind of law? So marriage is not even now a contract. Um, on the question of same-sex relationships, uh, the church generally, with some exceptions, supported um, the uh, 
promotion of civil partnerships, uh, those of us who opposed it, opposed it because of the way in which the law was framed. So uh, in the House of Lords, um, we uh, promoted an amendment to the government's bill uh, which would give the same rights um, to anyone who for any reason was cohabiting. You see, whether it was siblings, mother and daughter, whoever it was. And that would have made it morally acceptable. Uh, the government was defeated on the floor. Um, but they, of course, in the end, got their way. Um, my objection and the objection of many others to the civil partnerships bill, therefore, was that it was modeled on marriage, not that it was giving rights to, cert to a certain group of people. So it was mimicking marriage. And of course, the result of that was that in a few, year few years only, you had a full-blown bill on same-sex marriage. Well, you could see that was going to happen um, already. Um, Again, uh, although the church has not so far endorsed same-sex marriage, uh, by endorsing civil partnerships, it has made it very difficult for itself to resist the same-sex marriage argument. Uh, and eventually, if it continues along this line, it'll, it'll have to give way. So it's a long story. I'm sorry that I've had to tell the story, but I think it is very important for us to realize how the story of the church and the state have been intertwined in Anglicanism, where the tensions have been, uh, where the church has uh, stood for the truth and for the faith, where it has compromised, and indeed where it has capitulated. So I'll stop there. I think there are s there's still a little bit of time for a response from you. But as I was saying, after lunch, God willing, we will go on to the issues that arise from this story. Thank you very much indeed.